good for us, everybody, to pause for a moment to consider the greatness of this day. Fifty years ago today, Blessed Pope John XXIII convened the Second Vatican Council, which was without dispute the most significant ecclesial and religious event of the 20th century. The first session continued from today, 50 years ago, into December, and then there were three other sessions, respectively in the falls of 1963, 1964, and 1965. The Council closed in, on December 8th of 1965 on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. I want to call our memory just for a moment to that great moment when John the 23rd announced the Second Vatican Council. The room in which the press conference was held had a huge globe in it. And he used the phrase in reference to that globe as he considered his role as shepherd and pastor of the Universal Church. He indicated that globe and used for the first time a term which became the watchword of the Council and eventually the title of one of its major documents, Lumen Gentium. Lumen Gentium, which means the light of the nations, the light of the peoples. The Lumen Gentium, the light of the peoples, is Jesus Christ. And by the Second Vatican Council, Blessed Pope John XXIII wanted to make the Church a more apt vehicle, a more lively and engaged vessel for the proclamation of the Lumen Gentium, for the proclamation of Jesus Christ and the announcement of his gospel. A question which could be asked at the beginning is why they would have asked a member of Generation X, someone born in 1975, 10 years after the close of the Second Vatican Council, to reflect upon its historical context and to give a talk entitled The Renewal of Vatican II. I think it's a just question and one which is deserving of an answer. There are plenty of people here who remember, at least faintly, the Church as it was before the Second Vatican Council. There are people here who lived through the Council and who would be better poised than I to do a comparison and a contrast of the Church before and after the Council. So why would it be that someone of my generation would be speaking at the opening of the Year of Faith about something that happened 50 years ago when in fact I have not reached that age. <laughs> I think a worthy beginning of an answer to that question is this. That the implementation and the continuing effect of the Second Vatican Council depends now upon my generation and upon the generations which follow, upon many of our students who are here today. It becomes, in a certain sense, the question of a tale of two councils. Centuries from now, will the Second Vatican Council be remembered as a Reform Council that failed or as a Reform Council that succeeded? And there are precedents in the history of the Church Take, for instance, the Fifth Lateran Council, which was the last council of the Middle Ages, convened reluctantly by Pope Julius II and closed by Pope Leo X just before the break, just before the outbreak of the Protestant Reformation. It went from 1512 to 1517. Its purpose was to reform the church from the inside out. And yet its analysis, the Fifth Lateran Council's analysis of the problems of the time and the solutions which it presented failed. And the years following the close of the Council, the years following 1517, resulted in epic fracture in the internal life of the Church. And it's a wound, in fact, that Christianity has not yet recovered from. Will the Second Vatican Council be remembered along those lines? Or rather, will the Second Vatican Council be remembered as a great reforming council? A council along the lines of something like the Council of Trent, 
which had an impact upon just about every aspect of Catholic life for 400 years, which released a catechism which is still in print today by at least two publishers and on Kindle, and which enacted a reform of the liturgy which still has manifold devotees even among people much younger than me. The question is unanswered, but I believe that it lies with subsequent generations. The baby boomer generation has done their part in terms of the implementation of Vatican II. And those of us of Generation X and those who follow my generation have much work left to do because a council in the life of the church is not a static moment, but a council is rather, as the bishop said, the work of the Holy Spirit which is meant to be enlivening in the heart and the life of the church. And so my only excuse for being up here today is that I feel as slowly, slowly, the torch of leadership in the church passes to those of my generation and those that follow. Significant questions have to be answered and first asked about what Vatican II was, is, and will be. I want to begin just by a broad consideration of what was cooking in the pot at that moment in history in 1961 and 1962. And in order to do that, I think we need to back up a little. To the end of the 1700s and the beginning of the 1800s. During that time, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, the church was besieged by a movement, at least partly of its own making, called the Enlightenment, which also could be called modernity. I'll use the terms interchangeably. The Enlightenment was at least partly a, a treatment of the perennial question of the relationship between faith and reason. The drama which culminated in the Enlightenment had been unfolding at least since the trial of Galileo. And then through the writings of Immanuel Kant when he proposed, when he proposed religion according to pure reason and having historical embodiment in the ravages and the revolution of the French in 1789. The, the Enlightenment had at its core at least two fundamental premises. One had to do with the human person, that all men and women possess a dignity or a value that dictates, as Immanuel Kant said, that persons should never be treated as a means to an end but always as an end in themselves. People are not to be used by other people. All human beings ought to be free from any unfulfilling conditions imposed on them by others. And so at least one of the premises of modernity is the sovereignty of the human person. And the other one has to do with scientific progress. That the scientific method is meant to be the point the, the point of contact between human beings and the world and the society in which they are born. That the way that we come to understand the world in a true and accurate way is through science and the scientific method. And this is true not only in terms of overcoming, it's, it's true not only in terms of overcoming the limitations that are imposed upon people by the material world. In other words, we need to obliterate time and space. We need air travel and modern dental care, but also in terms of society. That science means social liberation as well as liberation from the limitations of the material world. The Enlightenment or modernity had actually arisen, it didn't just fall out of space, it arose out of that long thousand year period of the Middle Ages with various movements like the humanism of people like Erasmus and St. Thomas More, the philosophical nominalism of people like Roger Bacon and Peter Abelard, the Copernican Revolution 
which noted that for all the world it looks to us like the sun is moving through the sky, but actually that's a function of the rotation of the earth. And finally, the Protestant Reformation, which introduced for the first time into the West significant religious pluralism, which resulted by necessity almost in the secularization of culture and politics. The church had to engage with this because the Enlightenment and modernity brought about massive and sweeping changes in the way that people lived and in the way that they encountered and thought about the world. There were many things in those four movements that I talked about from the Middle Ages, in humanism, in philosophical nominalism, not so much that. Let's say in humanism, in the Copernican Revolution, and in the Protestant Reformation, there were aspects of each of those movements which had a Christian flavor or feel to them. And yet, the church had to ask itself the question of how it engaged with all of these massive shifts and changes in such a way that the errors which were being brought forth by the teachings of the Enlightenment philosophers and the people who were um, proponents of modernity, how that could happen in such a way that the church wouldn't lose its ability to preach the gospel. That was particularly difficult because some of the main proponents of the Enlightenment found the church and the hierarchy of the church and the doctrines of the church as the primary enemies against progress and against modernity. And so, when the church first had historical contact with the Enlightenment, the picture was not pretty at all. It was the French Revolution. And the memories of priests and religious exiled, imprisoned, tortured, executed, the memory of the suppression of the church and state control of religion, the memory of a dictator who was Lenin before his time, weighed heavily upon the memory of the church. This cascaded into other political movements throughout Europe and revolutions and discord, which caused great anguish in the hierarchy. And so you have Pope Pius IX issuing the syllabus of heirs, and Pope Leo XIII issuing at least four encyclicals against modernism, and Pope St. Pius X issuing the oath against modernism. All sorts of developments came along with the Industrial Revolution. I'm sorry, with the Enlightenment, such as the Industrial Revolution, the rise of capitalism and communist Marxism. And as things cascaded, and of course I'm papering over all sorts of things, but as they cascaded, I'd like to say that it brought us right up to the time of the Second Vatican Council with two bombs. One was the atomic bomb which represented, in a certain sense, the overriding achievement of the mastery of man over nature. And the other bomb was the birth control pill, which represented the use of technology to serve, in a way which had never been conceived of before, the enlightenment, enlightenment motion, notion of liberty or freedom. The ability to overcome the fertility of the human body, which had been a great constriction upon humanity from the beginning. And so in the 1950s, you have a theologian called Hansers von Balthasar who writes a book called The Raising, he calls it, he called it The Raising the Bastions, R-A-Z-I-N-G, Tearing Down the Bastions. It was a clarion call amidst many other voices in the church that the church needed to engage the modern world in a new way, that it needed to stop crouching behind the walls of the fortress that it had built out of the pain and suffering and the sheer shock of having Western culture, which it had been so fundamental in forming, fundamentally turn against it wholesale. 
And so too, blessed John the 23rd, who, um, who convened the council, said that the purpose of the Second Vatican Council would be to throw open the windows of the church so that the church could see out and the people could see in. Now, he said, John the 23rd said that the council was meant to transmit the doctrine of the church, I'm quoting, pure and in integral, pure and integral, without any attenuation or distortion. In other words, the purpose of the council wasn't to change any of the teachings of the church or even to engage in in-depth doctrinal treatment, but rather to say that the substance of faith is one thing and the way it's presented is another, and that the church found itself in a moment of crisis, perhaps a moment of crisis which perdures to this day in which modern women and men have decided that they've heard the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and they've had done with it. That they have no interest in this God of the heavy thumbs in a church filled with cranky old men who would fussily brood over people's freedom. And that the church needed a new way to speak into a reality of people who thought that they had already heard the gospel found that there was nothing in it for them, and had rejected it wholesale. And so the council was convened to proclaim or to announce the Lumen Gentium, the light to the nations, Jesus Christ and his saving promises in a new way so that the modern world could hear it again. The culture which cascaded out of the Enlightenment, the culture that comes to us from Luther and Descartes and Kant and Jefferson and Marx is in some ways like any other culture. Well, yes, it has a penchant in it which turns the heart away from God, but also just like every other era in the history of humankind, the culture which arises out of the Enlightenment is evangelically ambiguous. There are aspects in it which are ripe for the gospel and other aspects which are filled with hostility to the teachings of Christ. And the Vatican Council was an engagement with that, an attempt to sort through those things such that the church would have a clearer and more effective voice speaking into the, count, into the culture. In the late 90s, Margaret, Margaret Steinfels, the editor of the journal Commonweal, convened a symposium, not much different from our symposium, to take up the question of the relevance of modernity and the church. And one of the invited speakers was Cardinal Francis George, the Archbishop of Chicago. Cardinal George is pretty smart. Uh, in any case, he said that the Second Vatican Council was a limited accommodation to modernity in non-essentials for the purpose of evangelization. I'll say it again. He said that the Second Vatican Council was meant to be a limited accommodation to modernity in non-essentials for the purpose of evangelization. And he says in a different place that the Second Vatican Council is meant to be a missionary council, a council which renews the church's impetus to preach the gospel to the nations, to the Lumen Gentium, or of the Lumen Gentium to the nations. And there's a story about Karl Barth who was probably the greatest Protestant theologian of the 20th century. He was invited to the sessions of the Second Vatican Council and was deeply touched by that invitation. Toward the end of the council, he said, and this is Karl Barth, who early in his career was significantly anti-Catholic. He said toward the end of the council, if there is anywhere in the world in which the Holy Spirit is operating, it's in this council. But then he said this to Pope Paul VI, 
He said, Your Holiness, at what point will you know that the church has been updated enough? It's an interesting question, because it's a question a little bit with a sting in its tail. Holiness, when will you know? The, the word that the Italians used is aggiornamento, which means updating. When will you know that the church has been sufficiently updated because the difficulty or the danger is this? Now, he didn't say this. This is me talking now. <laughs> the difficulty or the danger is that a council, which is meant to proclaim the gospel in a new way, cannot take the modern world or any culture or society as the norm to conform itself to, but rather the gospel always has to be a leaven in its time and place. And that's a question which leads us to our next topic, which has to do with hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the study of interpretation of things. And so, how do we, in a broad and arching way, because there are smarter people than me who are going to talk about the meat and potatoes this afternoon, but how, in a broad and arching way, are we able to interpret the Second Vatican Council? Because when you think back again upon John the 23rd with that big globe, using the phrase lumen gentium for the first time, we recall that his stated purpose was to, pre was to find a new way for the church to preach the gospel into the modern era. But there is a question of hermeneutics because the council has not been widely conceived of in this way. Rather, it's been broadly conceived of as an attempt to modernize the church. You see the distinction that I'm making between modernizing the church on one hand, in other words, conforming the gospel to the modern world, and on the other hand, finding new ways to proclaim or to announce the gospel into the world, which is a different movement. In other words, grappling with the reality of the Enlightenment and modernity and what it meant. And so there was a crucible of faith which the council needed to deal with in terms of what modernity was and what the church could speak to in its eternal way in this new reality. A hermeneutic of reform or a hermeneutic of continuity, a way to understand and interpret the council as, as a continuation of the 21 councils which went before, as a deepening and a revitalizing of the teaching of the church through the centuries, a hermeneutic of continuity and a hermeneutic of reform in which non-essential elements would be aggiornamento, brought up to date, such that the gospel could be more effectively preached. This was the stated purpose that John the 23rd spelled out in his inaugural address to the council on this day 50 years ago. It also was the stated purpose with which Pope Paul VI, on December 8, 1965, sent the Council Fathers out into the world back to their dioceses. But that hasn't been the full interpretation of the Council, or even the most commonplace one, either by conservatives or by liberals in the years since. There's a story of a priest from Chicago who was studying at the North American College in Rome at the time of the Second Vatican Council. And he was involved in all the excitement. He was picking up theologians at the airport. He was watching the great procession of the bishops into St. Peter's Basilica. He was drinking coffee with people like Congar and Rahner and de Lubach and listening to their speeches. And then at the very end, he heard that great address by Pope Paul VI sending the bishops back out into their dioceses as great missionaries of the faith for a new era. And then he said, I got ordained a priest and I went back home and I discovered butterfly chasubles. And he said, I didn't know what happened. <laughs> 
I didn't remember anything from Sacrosanctum Concilium about butterfly chasubles, but all sorts of people, all sorts of things that happen, and I don't bring up butterfly chasubles to poke fun at anything or anybody. I break it up, I bring it up to call to mind in all of your minds some of the battles and discussions and the contentious issues which all of us as Catholics have had to wrestle through in the years since the Council. An idea arose that it was the right thing to follow not the texts of the Council themselves, but rather what was called the spirit of the Council. By the way, this has a great deal to do with the modern way of seeing things. Modernity, the whole philosophy and impetus behind the Enlightenment, is all about the passing away of an old order and the bringing of a new order. The French Revolution sneered at the, what they call the ancien regime, the, the old regime. And a new world order was meant to be brought about. So you can't really blame, in a certain sense, modern people for looking at an event so cosmic in its scope like the Second Vatican Council and seeing it not as a continuation of the church's teaching through the ages, but a passing away of an old dying order and the bringing forward of a new life-giving order. In this light, the texts of the Vatican Council, the constitutions and the declarations, came to be seen as power struggles between liberals and conservatives, with one side winning passage of of, of this little text here, such that the other side could win passage of this text on the other side of the page. Something like Cardinal Ottaviani versus Cardinal Bea. And this, this whole idea is identified as the hermeneutics of rupture, or the hermeneutics of discontinuity. And the council came to be seen in that way by the popular mind partly in response to the vicissitudes of our media culture. There was a redemptorist priest in Rome at the time, writing under the pseudonym Xavier Rin, who sent uh, missives back to the States, interpreting the council in just this way. And the foreign press corps during the 60s preoccupied themselves primarily with two events, the Vietnam War, and the Second Vatican Council, because what was happening in Rome was seen as a gigantic political bonanza, a great extravaganza of the struggle between the old order and the new order. And so in this sense, in the reading of the text of the Second Vatican Council, any time you see a continuity of deeper theological principles that conform with past teachings, they're to be seen as compromises aimed at getting votes for all the new ideas in the documents. And so what we're, not, what we're supposed to do is interpret things according to the spirit of the council, not according to what the council actually said. There was somebody who was at the council called Josef Ratzinger. You've heard of him, I think. <laughs> there was a, a moment in, at the end of the council when a great journal was formed called Concilium. And on its editorial board were all of the great voices, Congar, Skillebex, Kuhn, de Lubach, Rahner, von Balthasar, Ratzinger. But at a certain point, de Lubach, Ratzinger, and von Balthasar broke away from the editorial board of Concilium, Concilium and formed instead a journal called Communio. And it's interesting, Ratzinger at that point wrote an essay explaining his reasons for leaving Concilium. He gives three reasons and I'll only touch upon one. He says, the thing that you don't want to do is perpetuate the spirit of a council. And in fact, the mission statement of Concilium says that it wants to do just that, to perpetuate the spirit of the council. And here's how he explained it. He said, councils are those great events in the history of the church in which the church suspends itself and asks truly haunting and deep questions. 
about the nature of Jesus Christ, about the nature of the Trinity, about the sacraments and salvation and justification, and wrestles with those questions in an open way, and then resolving those questions turns back with great relief to the everyday work of the church which is proclaiming the gospel. Ratzinger said the last thing you want to do is to keep the church in that state of suspense in which everything is up for grabs. Because if you do that, then by nature the church loses its ability to speak in a definitive way. And certainly, if we're honest with ourselves, we have seen some movement toward that in the last 40 or so years, in which what has been described sometimes as beige Catholicism has become something of the norm. Uh, one of my teachers in graduate school, uh, Monsignor Robert Sokolowski, is one of the great the great minds regarding uh, philosophy and phenomenology in this country. But he also wrote a book in 2006 in which he talked about the Second Vatican Council and he used a image from American football. He said that, the, that there's this conception of a long pass, of a long pass from the Apostolic Age to Vatican II. Not a handing on of the tradition through the generations, but this long pass with only distortions between whether they be Byzantine or medieval or Baroque. That in a certain sense, the very progressive teachings of Jesus have been taken captive through the ages by this conservative overlay and what the philosopher Thomas Hobbes would call priestcraft. I like that word. <laughs> I feel like if it were true, I could do more mischief than usual. Priestcraft. That, 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 that the teachings of Jesus had been taken hostage and that they need to be freed from this ideological way of understanding things. And like everything, there's some truth in that. There was definitely an ideology, a conservative ideology, which was animating the work of the church in response to the Enlightenment, which was fueled by the memory of the ravages of the French Revolution and the ambiguity with which the church was living in the modern world in which its very purpose for existence was being questioned on every corner. But the difficulty with this reading of the Council, according to a hermeneutic of rupture or a hermeneutic of discontinuity, is that it itself, in overcoming an ideology or attempting to overcome an ideology, itself becomes an ideology along the same lines. And here I get to have the very kind and wonderful uh, honor of accusing everybody no matter where anybody falls on the ideological spectrum, conservatives and liberals have tended, because we live and breathe modernity, to understand the council not as the operation of the Holy Spirit in the church for the salvation of souls, but as a political event, a wrangling between different points of view. We need to resist and push back against these attempts to interpret the council down to a simple political struggle or an ideology, or if we don't, the council will fail. It will fail. Because the Second Vatican Council's purpose is the same as the purpose of every council, to lead believers more deeply into the contents and the requirements of faith, hope, and love. Ten years after the close of the Council, Pope Paul VI convened a synod in Rome. 
From that synod, a synod of bishops, arose the document Evangelii Nunciandi, his apostolic exhortation about evangelization. His main point is that the church doesn't have a mission, it is a mission. It just so happens that one of the bishops present at that synod, and in fact, a person who had quite a bit to do with the drafting of Evangelii Nunciandi was the Archbishop of Krakow, Karol Wojtyla, who became John Paul II. Fast forward then to that day in 1983, when Pope John Paul II was meeting with bishops of the Western Hemisphere in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and used for the very first time the words new evangelization. And what he said is this, the new evangelization is the old evangelization. It's the proclamation of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But it will be new in three ways. In its ardor, in its expression, and in its methods. That for John Paul II, who was a young bishop at the Second Vatican Council, and who was deeply engaged in the goings-on of the council because he was one of them who could speak fluent Latin, <laughs> John, for John Paul II, the, the Second Vatican Council and its outgrowth was meant to be a renewal of the whole idea of evangelization in the church. It would be new in ardor, in expression, and in method. It will be new in ardor. Cardinal Newman talks about the effect of the banks of a river that it's the banks of a river that give a river all of its force. The current has flowing power because of the banks. And if you pull down the, bla the banks of the river, it becomes a big, lazy lake. And that there is a certain sense in which Christianity in our time finds itself in a big, lazy lake. I talk to our students who are phenomenal young men and women and who have grown up in this culture, which in many ways is post-Christian. And the impression that they give me is that everybody's just kind of floating along on one of those big inflatable rafts. Just kind of enjoying themselves. You know, kind of, maybe their finger goes into the water and they spin themselves around just a little bit. And they see somebody else over there, way over, and they say, hey, hey, how you, hey yeah, how you do? Good, good, good. Don't come any closer to me. I'm uh, having a good time. I hope you're having a good time. Uh, and of course, the difficulty is that what arises out of that is a type of thing where the claims of the gospel can't penetrate the human soul. So if I say to you, I'm a Christian, I believe Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, the response that's not unlikely to come to me is, that's, that's, very, that's very nice. I like pinochle. <laughs> In other words, the, the, the catching forth, the excitement of the gospel has to be reinterpreted to the people of our age in a new way. Dorothy Sayers talked about the gospel as the greatest drama that was ever staged. She said that if if we say that the story of the gospel is dull, we don't know what excitement means. You can say it's false, but please don't say it's dull. She says, now we may call that doctrine exhilarating or we may call it devastating. We may call it revelation or we may call it rubbish, but if we call it dull, those words have no meaning at all. And that for Sayers, it's the dogma that's the drama. The dogma that's the drama. And how important this is in our own time. I'm forced to skip over many, many things here, but let me just say a word about the deep confusion that we find in our time about God and who God is. Do you remember that autobiography of Thomas Merton, Seven Story Mountain? He gets to a point where he's talking about 
his conversion. And just at the moment of his conversion, he reads a book by Etienne Gilson, who was a great Thomist philosopher, in which Gilson makes the point from St. Thomas Aquinas that God is not ens sumum, in other words, the greatest being, but ipse esse subsistens, the, the, the subsistent grounding of all being. That God is not a genus of any being, but God is the grounding in which all things move and live and have their being. And this is actually an important point, and it blew Merton's mind. Because he said, I had always thought of God as a noisy mythological creature. And you can see that if, if God is understood as he is in our modern culture as a result of the Enlightenment and partly as a result of the ineffectiveness of the preaching of the faith, if God is conceived of as the highest being instead of the grounding of all being, he is necessarily in competition with us fussily brooding over our freedom, God of the heavy thumbs, trying to extinguish our freedom. And it's a very small step from there to someone like Jean-Paul Sartre, who says that if God exists, I am not free. Or to Feuerbach, who is the father of modern, modern atheism and the great inspiration to Karl Marx, who said, saying no to God means saying yes to man. How very different from this is the Christian understanding of God. Think, think of the burning bush that Moses approaches, and he sees that it's burning, but it's not consumed. It's burning, he says, but it's not consumed. How different this is from when the gods of myth break into human existence. When Zeus comes, people get incinerated. When Prometheus discovers fire, the gods are furious because they're fundamentally in competition. But of course, the Christian message is something radically different from that. The Christian message is that when God draws near to us, he illumines us. We become incandescent. But this understanding of God is not well known. St. Irenaeus said, um, Gloria Dei Homo Vivens, that the glory of God is a human being fully alive. But this understanding of God is not well known in our culture, and we need to insist upon it. So too, and I'll say this only briefly, so too in terms of the new evangelization, we have to deal with perennial problems which in our own day are more exaggerated than ever, such as the idea that all human fulfillment can come from the material world that pleasure, honor, wealth, and power are the end-all and be-all of human existence, and that they can satiate the human hunger for the absolute. Of course, of course this isn't true. And the success of the gospel depends upon the undermining of that idea. St. John of the Cross says that we have infinite caverns within us. Infinite caverns. And we spend our lives throwing things into them, and yet they can never be filled by the things of this world. And modernity would simply paper over those things. And so the new evangelization needs to insist upon simple principles in respect to the last thing that I just said. Remember that St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless, Lord, and they, our hearts are restless, and they will not rest until they rest in you. In this respect, we're all Augustinians. Anyway, uh, I move now to the final moment of my introduction of Vatican II. What kind of council will it be remembered as in years to come? in centuries to come. What will be the enduring legacy of the Second Vatican Council? In many ways, dear friends, it depends upon the revivification, the revitalization 
of the documents of Vatican II and the outgrowth, especially in the New Catechism, in our own time. The Church's engagement with the world, its ability to speak truth into a world which is desperately needful of the gospel of Jesus Christ, can find renewed impetus and expression in this year of faith which we stand at the threshold of. If centuries from now Vatican II ranks among the great reforming councils, it will be due to a fidelity in faith, worship, holiness, and scholarship in continuing the missions of Jesus the Word incarnate and God the Holy Spirit. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. All the great reform councils were great because what followed them were generations of saintly popes, bishops, priests, laity, religious, and scholars whose lives after the council embodied fidelity and devotion, who spoke of a church, to quote St. Augustine again, which reflected the image of Jesus the Lord who is ever ancient and ever new. One of the fathers of the council, Henri de Lubac, wrote a work called The Splendor of the Church. In it, he quoted uh, the poet Paul Claudel in a commentary that Claudel had written on the Song of Songs. We have at our disposal for loving understanding and serving God, not, all, not only our own powers, but everything from the Blessed Virgin in the summit of heaven down to the poor African leper who bell in hand whispers the responses of the Mass through a mouth half eaten away. The whole of creation, visible and invisible, all history, all the past, the present, and the future, all the treasure of the saints multiplied by grace, all that is at our disposal as an extension of ourselves, a mighty instrument. All the saints and the angels belong to us. We can use the intelligence of St. Thomas, the right arm of St. Michael, the hearts of Joan of Arc and Catherine of Siena, and all the hidden resources which have only to be touched to be set into action. Everything of the good, the great, and the beautiful from one end of the earth to the other, everything which begets and gives new life, it is as if all that were our work. The heroism of the missionary, the inspiration of the doctors of the church, the generosity of the martyrs, the genius of the artists, the burning prayer of the poor Clares and the Carmelites, it is as if all that were ourselves. It is ourselves. All that is one with us, from the north to the south, from the alpha to the omega, from the orient to the occident. We clothe ourselves in it. We set it in motion. All that is in the orchestral activity by which we are at one and the same time revealed and made as nothing. By which we are at the same time revealed and made as nothing. I read that passage to you, brothers and sisters, because of this. This expression of the mission of the church is an expression which only could be made in this particular way in the light of a church engaging with modernity. Because you see in it something that you don't see in the writings of the saints of antiquity, although you see it in other ways. It's this turning toward the subject which happened in the Enlightenment, the first of those great premises which I articulated to you earlier. In other words, here you have something of the spirit of the Enlightenment, the turning toward the subject, enlivened and made incandescent by the Gospel, such that I understand myself not as the grounding for all existence, but is part of the church universal, cascading through history, bringing joy and purpose and meaning to every human heart. I'll never forget in all my life when we went over to select the location of the University of Mary's campus in Rome. I took with me a handful of our student leaders, and one of them came back 
and spoke to his fellow students in this way. He said, when I was over there, when I was over there, I prayed in the tombs of the saints. St. Philip Neri and Robert Bellarmine and Peter and Paul, I prayed at their tombs. I wandered through the catacombs. I stood inside the Colosseum and I could hear there, almost echoing as though from the marble, the cries of our ancestors in faith and their singing as they faced their death. And in that great cascade, as I read the seemingly infinite list of the popes, as I considered the grandeur and the marvel of the church, I felt so small. And yet, at the same time, I felt as though my life could make a difference. I felt so small, and yet I felt at the same time as, my li as if my life could make a difference. I would submit to you, my brothers and sisters, that that's the way that evangelism can and should unfold in our modern time. That as we overcome the ravages of the ego, which cause people to catapult toward unhappiness and dissatisfaction and a kind of drunken stupor in which pleasure no longer has any meaning, we can speak into that in a new way with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can bring the gospel to life with a whole different type of ardor through the use of new methods and expressions, but it's the timeless gospel that we preach. It is not some new iteration. It is the message of the church for all ages. Holiness. Holiness is the great fruit which the Council Fathers desired to come from the work of the Second Vatican Council. Holiness, union and friendship with God is the only way that this council, which we are the inheritors of, will be remembered in the ages to come. Our Bishop David Kagan has written a pastoral letter for the Year of Faith, I Call You Friends, about this very topic. When we speak of Jesus Christ as the Lumen Gentium, as the light to the nations and the light to all peoples, He is also and at the same time a light to each of us. And here the simplicity and the beauty of the message of Jesus Christ comes tumbling down in a way which is so simple and clear. Jesus Christ cares about each of us. He wants to be a part of our lives. He thinks about us all the time. And when we close our eyes in death, we shall open them again to see his face. Thanks for listening, everyone.